Hello everyone. Welcome back to Author Journey. My name is CJ Anaya. I feel like it has been forever since we chatted because it has <laughs> because things are crazy right now. I've been going a little stir crazy in the house trying to figure out how to um, how to do these videos uh, with the quarantine in place for the virus uh, and having four kids at home and homeschooling them and it never being very quiet. So fortunately, I have a day where the kids are in the mountains with their father doing their social distancing in a uh, place of nature. <laughs> so, so it's nice and quiet here and I can get this done and I'm really excited because I've been wanting to do part nine of character arc and story structure for a while. So if you are new to the channel and you have not yet watched the first eight sections or uh, video tutorials of this, go back because this ain't going to help you till you do. If you're new, please subscribe, um, hit that bell so you can be notified of new videos. Uh, and let's, let's get started here. This video is going to be a little bit longer because we are covering um, the full 25% of the, the last part of the second half of the act. That did, did that make any sense? I'll say it again. It's going to be a long video, so I'm just warning you now, but it's a very important part that I don't want us to skimp over, okay? So if you need to break things up, get some popcorn, nachos, water, whatever you need. Um, in the previous video, we talked about that midpoint moment, the moment of truth or the aha moment for your character, when the lie is turned on its head and your character starts to see that maybe the lie is wrong. So the second half of the second act is what is known as the proactive phase because this glimpse of life without the lie gives your character a chance to actively solve conflicts and work toward achieving main wants, goals, and needs. So the conflict is no longer being solely controlled by the antagonist or whatever represents the antagonist in your book, okay? While this is wonderful for your protagonist, there is still the lurking matter of the lie that, that makes an appearance here and there. It, it gets the best of him because he hasn't let go of it completely. And that's kind of where we're taking the, the next 25% of this book. So the second half of the second act is all about action. And your character um, had a huge revelation that challenged his lie at the midpoint. He's going to take action based on that stellar epiphany. For the next 25% of your book until act three, your protagonist is going to do a few important things. And they don't have to be in order as I present them. OK, um, it, it's going to depend on your pacing and flow of your story as far as when these things occur, how they occur uh, in the next 25 percent of your book. So before, with the lie so deeply ingrained, your character is solving problems with less uh, panache, trying to achieve his goals with the wrong tools. The truth gives him another way of looking at things and attacking the problems he faces. For example, after her heart to heart with Asher, and the realization that life with Asher would very easily lead to happiness for her. She boldly gets married to him the next day with less reservations than she had before. She's placing a lot of faith and trust in this contract that she and Asher have created. So there needs to be a bold moment where they take action moving forward based on this new truth that they are considering, that they're wanting to embrace. It's, it's what is known as a progression for your character arc. Uh, for Asher, he has a real come-to-Jesus moment when he realizes she cared about him when he was Lawrence. His response is so strong, he feels ready to tell her everything, who he is, and let the chips fall where they may. So his proactive inclination is to reveal his truth. That's the pro progression for him, what he's ready to do. And now we, we hit the snafus because there are always setbacks. So these strong moves toward getting out of their own way and embracing truth is always going to hit roadblocks where the actions of truth they attempt to take run into lies or the lie that they believe. They are trapped between the old lie and the new truth. So remember the outlining process for plot and structure. You're dealing with a series of progressions and setbacks with the protagonist in the proactive action-taking mindset. When Asher gets ready to confess everything, and that's a progression for him. Audrey interrupts him and brings up Ben, the man who hurt her best friend. Asher immediately recognizes the guy and realizes after this heart to heart with Audrey that her best friend was hurt by a guy he had refused as a client. But Audrey is under the assumption that, that this love coach that he 
she doesn't know he's a love coach yet, um, took Ben on as the client. So while he was ready to confess all and be himself, when he now has to, um, he has to wonder if being himself and sharing who he is and revealing that he's the love coach is going to lose him Audrey in a different way. Um, so revealing who he is is now not the best idea. He has to get a handle on things first by calling this guy and figuring out what Ben has said, trying to figure out how he's going to do some damage control here so he doesn't actually move forward with the progression that he should have taken. It's just another setback. Audrey is now married in the moment, ready to ease into this idea of Asher being a good guy and this agreement being something that could possibly turn into more. She's even ready to confide in him concerning certain things she has discovered when a little further on in the book she catches Asher being kissed by his nasty secretary. Um, so she doesn't know he didn't initiate it, but in that moment her new truth is in a vulnerable way and her old lie is trying to convince her she should have seen this coming. Okay, um, So she, she was snooping around a bit. She was going after the things she wanted, trying to still figure out who uh, this, you know, love coach is. And she was ready to confide in him, which is a big step for her and yet another progression, something that she's leaning more towards in the way of the new truth. Um, and then the old lie is trying to convince her that, nope, he's just a cheater and a horrible person, just like, um, just like Duke was, and why should she care anyway? Because this is just a marriage of convenience. Okay, so another setback after a really nice progression. So remember, these don't have to be in order. Um, Asher's problem and his setback, his progression and setback occurred two chapters before Audrey had her own stuck moment. So just play around with it, see what works as far as pacing and flow goes with your characters and the events that need to happen. You'll be dealing with a tug of war scenario emotionally during this 25%. Your characters will make strides to move forward, but circumstance will nearly manage to reinforce the lie. One minute, truth will motivate action. The next moment, lie will swing in and cause doubts, mistakes, and confusion, tripping up your character's progress. So there's going to be backsliding, okay? And we need to see moments of that. Despite her new trust in Asher, Audrey is still bound and determined to find the love coach and make him pay. So she continues her investigation, leading to a few dangerous scenarios for her and a bit of dishonesty as she snoops around Asher's office. Asher fails to mention Ben and his true involvement since other things just keep coming up. It's never the right time to confront the problems. He also fails to tell her about her ex-husband to some extent, not wanting to worry her. So many secrets between them at this point, even though their intentions are good and they're still trying to lean more towards the truth. So then you're going to need to have some mirror moments within this 25%. This feeling the lie gives them isn't comfortable for your characters any longer. They may backslide a bit, but this new truth gives them some hope and some heavy internal conflict. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance going on, okay? Because they don't necessarily buy into the lie, but they don't necessarily buy into the truth. It's very, very confusing. Um, but the truth does make your character feel lighter, and so they gradually try to go toward that despite the lie um, that can still have a hold on their psyche. What the character wants may be put on the back burner as he continues to move toward embracing the truth and consequently toward the thing he needs. So there's more progressions that you will see. Audrey willingly discusses what she saw between Asher and his secretary rather than brushing it under the rug as she would have before the midpoint. So there's a mirror moment there. Whereas before the midpoint, she would have remained distrustful, um, not willing to talk about what she saw between Asher and his secretary, um, just willing to believe the worst. Now we have this moment where she's bringing it up and she's discussing things and not assuming the worst, but ready to give him the benefit of the doubt. Asher divulges that his secret was in contact or well, that his secretary was in contact with her ex-husband, and they need to be extra careful. He even hints at his feelings for her, which is huge, because he hasn't as of yet done so, and that they have something important to talk about once he makes sure Audrey is safe. So before the midpoint, he would have waited to gauge her feelings to see if she loved him, um, and he never would have just come out and told her that he really had feelings for her and that he wants to discuss things about their future that is more serious, more permanent solution than just being married for a year. Um, 
these are mirror images of how they would have handled things in the first half before the truth was able to take root. So make sure you have a scene or two that showcases the differences in their behavior before the midpoint and after the midpoint. Okay, the end of the second half of the second act uh, has your character achieving a great win that actually ends up being more of a false victory. It's an opportunity for your character to go after what he wants, okay? Just one more stab at going after what they want, um, which seems like a victory, um, even though truth is hanging in the background, pushing them towards what, what they need. Um, so your protagonist is going to have to embrace that lie one more time to do this, okay? Um, an example of this for Asher is when he gets Audrey to that wedding as his wife. The whole point of getting married, well, it wasn't the whole point for him, but one of the main things he was trying to do was cover his butt and not have this client reveal that he didn't have a wife. Um, and so she is there at the wedding. She's his wife. Um, things are going great between them. It's a victory. It's huge. Um, victory at first, but fail in the end, because not only does Audrey find out that Asher is Lawrence Weston at this place and recognize him um, finally, she realizes she's been lied to all this time, and the secretary ends up showing up and spilling the beans as to who the love coach truly is. So she leaves the wedding she agreed to attend and heads over to her mother. So there's really no true victory for Asher as he loses Audrey in that moment where he was chasing after that want. He just hadn't told her yet. He had not told her yet. And if he had, instead of just holding on to the want, um, he might have been able to get what he really needed in that moment. So what you're going to do is you're going to have a very important point right before. It's, it's that transition between the the second half of the book, or the second act to the very end, into the third act. So right before your character throws caution to the wind and goes after what they want most, there's going to be a moment where the truth comes a calling. For Audrey, this happens when she goes to her mother's after she's found out everything. Her best friend comes over. She reveals that Asher lied. He's the love coach. He's a horrible person. Her friend and mother don't necessarily believe it at first, but even when they do concede, they decide to throw a bit of logic at her. So this, these issues can happen in the form of dialogue in any way you want to present it. Um, so even though she's bound and determined to believe the worst of Asher, it's, she's being challenged a little bit. Um, this is where K.M. Whelan suggests you blatantly demonstrate the crux of your character's arc. Your character needs this moment because it will help him finally fight against the lie in the third act when given the opportunity to choose which one your character wishes to accept, the, the lie or the truth. So just to show you how blatantly the lie is staring her in the face um, and yet how badly she wants to just prove a point, I'm going to read an excerpt from this very scene that will then propel Audrey into the third act where she um, stubbornly goes after the thing she wants by still trying to prove that Asher maliciously coached Ben into hitting it and quitting it with her bestie. Now, if you want to skip ahead a little bit, rather than listening to this excerpt that I'm going to read to you, you can because it's just basically going to be summing up what I've discussed as far as how to write this last part of the, the second act. And it's also going to ask you some very good questions that you can pose for yourself to kind of help you plot and plan that part of your book. Um, if not, then just stick around and listen to the excerpt and we'll go into how this is an example of the crux of the issue or presenting and demonstrating the, the crux of the issue for your character. This is chapter 28 in Trusting the Billionaire. It's Lawrence, I say, as I run through the front door of my mom's house and slam it behind me. I'm in the kitchen, Audrey, I hear her yell. I've moved past the entryway and through the small living room that opens up into the kitchen where my mom is currently making tacos of all things, lots of them. My anger and hurt are, mom are momentarily forgotten as I see several tacos already prepared and plated. Am I barging in on something here? You said you were available. And you sent me a rather obscure text saying you were getting divorced. And did I have time to chat? I wasn't about to turn down such an interesting visit no matter who I had coming over. Though Lars should be here in a few minutes. He never turns down my tacos. That's a ton of tacos. Are you expecting anyone else? She waves her spatula in the air in a dismissive gesture. 
Val's headed over. I let her know you were in crisis mode, so she should be here any minute. I slap a hand against my forehead and let out a frustrated moan. You invited Val? I'm not ready for her to know what I've found out yet. I'm also not ready for the lecture I know she'll be delivering, just as soon as I tell her what a horrible mistake I've made. Too late for that, Val says as she walks into the kitchen. I'm pretty much always ready to deliver some kind of scathing lecture when it comes to the two of you ladies. Awesome. I didn't even hear her walk through the door. Ugh, this conversation is going to be unpleasant. My bestie walks up to the kitchen island and takes a seat at one of the bar stools. Sit, she orders. I'm dying to hear about why you think you need to get a divorce after signing a contract stating you would remain married for at least a year. She grabs a taco, lifts it to her mouth, and says, And don't leave anything out, before biting into the tasty thing. I sit on the stool next to her and grab a taco, even though I'm not even close to being hungry. Do you two remember Lawrence Weston from high school? Val nods. You're talking about the most adorable geek at our school? The one we all secretly wanted to date? Bingo, I say. Well, what about him? He's my husband. Val lowers her taco and turns to look at me. I beg your pardon. You have two husbands now? You don't need a lecture from me. You need a psych evaluation. Asher Weston is Lawrence Asher Weston. Her brows raise in astonishment as she considers me for a moment. There's no way. Asher is built like a toned basketball player. Lawrence Weston, though adorable, had a reedy frame with delicate features that made you wonder if he might be gay. The boy done growed up, I say. She shakes her head. That's crazy. It's a total transformation. It's a legit geek makeover, the kind you only see in the movies. How the heck did he change so much from high school? I didn't even recognize him, and I never forget a face. Well, I definitely didn't have any idea who he was, but he knew me. I remember thinking it was strange that he not only knew my full name, but he knew about my nonprofit and the fact that I needed financial assistance. Val takes a bite of her taco and munches on it, looking just as bewildered as I feel. Why didn't he say anything? Why did he act like you two had never met, had never been on a debate team together, shared a biology class together, or even worked on Greece for crap's sake? I mean, you guys weren't exactly close, but it's enough history to mention. Val stares at me and then looks at my mother with a suspicious expression. That's when I notice my mom has that cat that swallowed the canary look. Doris, you're remaining uncharacteristically silent. Any thoughts on this rather shocking revelation? It's no shocking revelation to me. Lawrence has been in love with my daughter for years. I was thrilled when he finally popped the question. My job out hits the counter as my mother puts another taco on my plate. You, he, finally popped the question? What in the world are you talking about, Mom? Lawrence came over to the house one time after you left a notebook in biology. Uh, anyway, I let him in and fattened him up a bit. He ate a whole plate of my gourmet chocolate chip cookies and washed it down with some milk. We talked about you, his interest in you, and I, am, I encouraged him to go for it. I liked him and hated Duke, so I thought it was a win. Amazing, Val says. She takes another bite of her taco, but her wide eyes remain fixed on my mother. With her mouth full of taco, she says, I always knew Lawrence had a thing for Audrey. She was completely clueless, and he always got so tongue-tied around her. Then what happened? I give Val an incredulous look and open my mouth to interrupt, but my mom scoots over to Val's side of the counter and leans in like she has some juicy gossip to share. We remained good friends. After you kids graduated from high school, Lawrence still came to visit me. He checked in on me and asked about Audrey all the time. I gave him a good talking to on many of those occasions. He was so terrified to ask Audrey out on a date, he missed his chance and Duke got her instead. Val tisks in disapproval. So much time wasted. Why was he scared to ask her out in high school? Oh, he thought he was too nerdy. Never thought Audrey was interested, but I knew better. My Audrey just needed a little push. She never, ever believed she deserved better than Duke. Oh, a tragedy on so many levels. You know how often I've lectured her on settling? On this misguided belief she has that Duke was the only guy who could possibly love her? My bestie is not helping in any way, shape, or form. I blame her no good father for that, but we're veering away from the good stuff. Oh, Val says. There's more good stuff? Do tell. She takes another bite of her taco and washes it down with the soda my mom hands her. I look back and forth between the two of them in disbelief. You do realize I'm still here, right? Even after Lawrence made his first million, he never forgot me or Audrey. He paid for her hospital bills when Duke beat her up that very last time. What? Are you serious? I say. And he also gave me the money to help Audrey move into her own house after that. I can't even tell you how many times he donated money to her nonprofit whenever he discovered she was in a pinch. Incredible, 
Val's eyes are as wide as saucers. That's the most romantic thing I've ever heard. And the first time hearing of it, I say, feeling a little unsteady as I think about all the anonymous donations I've received over the last few years. Lawrence was helping me and looking out for me like some guardian angel. My heart melts just a little at the thought of him coming to my aid, agonizing over whether or not he should ask me out. Lawrence Weston always had a thing for me? How did I not see it? Why didn't he ever tell me? Why didn't he ever say anything about it? Why didn't he try to connect with me after I left Duke? He even paid for my hospital bills after I was attacked, and he's been helping me with my agoraphobia, Mom says. I squint at my mom like she's an alien species. You told me Pastor Morris and the ladies in your church raised funds to help you pay for everything, I say in a dry tone. My mom gives me an indignant look. I wasn't going to break Lawrence's trust. He didn't want me blabbing about it to you, making you feel as if you owed him anything. He wanted to win you on his own merits instead of using his money to grab your attention. She turns back to Val, which was why I was so shocked when Audrey called and told me she was entering into an agreement with Asher Weston, marrying him in exchange for funding her nonprofit. Didn't seem like the approach he had originally intended, but I was game either way. This is so unbelievable. That's why you didn't give me any grief when I told you about the wedding? You knew exactly who Asher Weston was and you were more than happy to watch me walk down the aisle. My mother gives me a wicked smile, completely ignoring my accusatory tone. When we had our weekly Starbucks date a few days prior, he told me he was going to get up the nerve to call you and reconnect. Imagine my surprise when I discovered he'd gone from reconnect to full-blown marriage proposal. Shocking, Val says, eating it all up, including her taco. I slam my hand on the counter. Now wait just a minute. What do you mean your weekly Starbucks date? I told you about them, she says in a demure tone. After five years of refusing to go anywhere with me, you finally mentioned you had selective agoraphobia when making weekly runs to Starbucks. You failed to mention that Lawrence Weston was your partner in crime. Well, how else was I supposed to get to Starbucks? He's my designated driver. Val doubles over with laughter, nearly losing her grip on her taco. Doris, you are the absolute worst. She continues to hoot with laughter as I stare at my mother with steely eyes. Were either you or Lawrence planning on telling me the truth, Mom? Lawrence definitely wanted to. Not sure why he couldn't muster the courage after pining for you for so many years. Mom grabs a taco and takes a bite as I sit there and try to figure out what exactly I'm feeling now. Honestly, I have no idea what to make of this scenario. I was under the impression that Lawrence hadn't felt a thing for me. I'd fully believed he'd just been trying to play with my affections, get me to fall in love with him, and then hurt me. But my theory really doesn't make sense in the face of cold, hard facts. Why would he do that? Everything Asher does is methodical and based on logic. Honestly, why would a billionaire like Asher even waste his time going to all the trouble to play me like that, actually signing a contract that legally obligated to fund my nonprofit? Now that I'm not thinking with my emotions, logically, my assumptions don't make a lot of sense. He'd have to be a very bored, very evil billionaire indeed if all he'd been doing was playing a seriously screwed up game just to mess with me the way he taught Ben to mess with Val. <gasps> and then I remember Ben and Val. You mentioned you wanted to divorce Lawrence. Care to explain, Mom asks? He's the love coach. He's the one who taught Ben to hurt Val. Val and my mom both look at me and then stare at each other for a few moments before bursting into peals of laughter. <sighs> I roll my eyes heavenward and grip my taco like it's got all the answers to this messed up situation. I take a vicious bite out of its crunchy exterior, eating my emotions. Yeah, this feels normal. There's no way in the world Lawrence is capable of being the love coach. He couldn't get up the nerve to ask you out for years. Then when he did, it ended up being under the pretense of an arranged marriage. A mutually beneficial situation for you both, Val says. If he's this dating guru, then he's failed to drink his own Kool-Aid. Oh, he is the love coach. No doubt about that, Mom says. This gets both mine and Val's attention. No freaking way, Val says. Does that account for his total transformation? Mom nods, giving Val a knowing look. He wanted to teach other guys to go after the girl of their dreams. He wanted to help people. But he didn't help Val, I insist. He was Ben's coach. He taught Ben all the right things to say. I'm feeling seriously deflated here. All of my righteous anger is being robbed from me with each bomb my mom drops. I have the right to be absolutely furious, dang it. Do you have proof? Val asks. Et tu, Brute? She should be just as furious as I am. I talked to Ben, I said. And Ben told you that Lawrence taught him to play me? Well... 
uh, I think back on that conversation and realize Ben didn't actually confirm that the love coach taught him how to be a player. He kind of, he, he skirted the issue, changed the subject, asked how you were doing. He wants you back, by the way. Val gives a mock yawn. Old news. He can take an impromptu jump off a steep, steep cliff for all I care. I grip the rest of my taco and nearly break it in half. I'm telling you, Lawrence lied to me about everything. His identity, who the love coach is, taking on Ben as a client. But it feels like you two aren't taking any of this seriously. Give us proof that Lawrence was the one who helped Ben break Val's heart, and we might be more inclined to label him as the bad guy. My mom doesn't look even remotely worried. I find that annoying. I'm with your mom on this one. Without proof, all you really have to be outraged about is the fact that a guy who has been in love with you for years didn't tell you who he was right away after entering into a marriage of convenience with you that you wholeheartedly agreed to despite knowing nothing about him. A guy who asked for marriage in return for funding your nonprofit. It's not like he was demanding sexual favors. He just wanted to take care of you. <sighs> Are you finished? I ask. She holds up a finger, takes another bite of taco, swallows, and continues her tirade. You rushed into it without taking the time to find out who he really was because you wanted revenge. You wanted to make the love coach pay for all the hurt you thought he caused me. And let's be honest, you wanted him to pay for all the hurt Duke caused you, even though he had nothing to do with it. Lots of misguided anger there, Audrey. I'm still pushing for a psych eval. Is she right? Do I shoulder some of the blame here? I entered into the marriage for the money, yes, but also to snoop around and get justice, get vengeance, get a little of Val's and my own back in the process. Love is pain. Love destroys, and I wanted the love coach to feel that pain. I wanted to destroy his little side business in the process. Those were my ulterior motives. Lawrence may have entered into the marriage under false pretenses, but so did I. This mess is just as much your fault as it is his, Val adds as an afterthought, echoing my own musings. And there's the Val I know and love. How long have you been holding back that brutal lecture? A good ten minutes. It was agonizing. Doris, you got any more chocolate-filled scones in this establishment? My mom gives a haughty sniff. Does Johnny Depp do drugs? My phone rings just then. I fish it out of my purse and stare at it in shock. It's the number to Debbie's diner. Hello, I say. Uh, I'm looking for Audrey. Yes, is this Ruby? Yeah, look, I've got that footage you were wanting to see, but you'll need to get here as soon as possible. I'm really supposed to be messing, uh, not messing with the security tapes, and my boss will be back later tonight. If you want to know the truth about your mysterious love coach, you need to come to the diner now. On my way. I hang up my cell just as Val stands up and blocks my way forward. Where are you going? You wanted proof, right? Well, I know where we can get some. We're headed to Debbie's diner. Oh, that trashy place near the beach? Mom looks way too animated as she rounds the corner. I'm all in. I give her a skeptical once-over. I thought Lars was coming over. He has a key. He'll find the tacos just fine without me. Your trainer has a key to your house. Her expression is all innocence as she picks imaginary lint off her shoulder. He keeps late hours. My eyes nearly bug out of their sockets. Is he living here with you? The lascivious, the lascivious look on my mom's face warns me she's about to share details of her love life that are not G-rated. You know what? I don't, I don't want to know. I shake my head, deciding to let that one go for now and focus on the real obstacle here. The diner is in a pretty shady neighborhood, Mom, and you're agoraphobic. She grabs her purse from the table, slings it over her shoulders, and says, I'm feeling decidedly selective today. So, I read that entire chapter, A, to give you an example of this very important moment, okay? So I'm blatantly demonstrating the crux of my character's arc right here. It's, does she believe that, that love destroys? Does she hold on to this lie? Does she do everything she can to prove that, um that he's the love coach and that he actively coached Ben into destroying Val's life. So even when all of this has been presented to her and her sister or her best friend and her mom are, are showing her, giving her examples of how maybe this could have swung a different way, she's still bound and determined to hold on to the lie a little bit just at the chance that she could, you know, possibly offer up some proof, a real video of Asher working with Ben. So that's where I'm able to show and give an example of the crux of the issue, and I wanted that for you so that you would have a better idea of how you could work that into your story. 
Okay, so now you're going to ask yourself these questions to help you as you plot and plan the second half of the second act. What action does your character take right after the, mid, the midpoint to take control of the conflict? How does the epiphany allow your character to see these problems in a new light or to see the conflict in a new light? How is he still clinging to the lie and how does this cause friction with the truth, that cognitive dissonance that we were discussing? What uh, before and after scene or mirror moment can you add to these events to illustrate the progress that your character actually has made um, beyond the midpoint? And what false victory is going to end the second act? So they're holding on to that want, going for it, in, and it ends up being kind of a hollow false victory. Uh, what are you going to do to demonstrate the truth or the crux of the issue and propel your characters into the third act? And how is your character going after what they want one last time? So your character is going to betray the truth a little bit at the end of the second act in that moment as they go after what they want one last time. But they're not completely abandoning the truth, which is what we will see happening uh, in the third act. So that's lesson nine. I believe we're going to wrap up this series with lesson 10 discussing um, the third act. I'm not sure how I'm going to break that up. I know this was very long, so <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I just really wanted to get all this information to you. Uh, break it up, watch it slowly, process it, do what you need to do, and again, skip the entire excerpt part if you feel like that demonstration of how I utilize that in my book isn't helpful or um, if you just don't want to take the time to listen to it, but it is there in case you need an example. Thanks so much for tuning in and listening. Let me know if you have any questions, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.